Ursula hat die letzte Aufstellung im Herbst bei uns, diesen Aufstellung Atem Spirit. Und wir hatten ein Gespräch über die nächste Aufstellung in 2018. Und sie hat mir gesagt: Ach, ich bin ein großer Fan von der Arbeit von Lucy Scarce. Und ich habe es sofort gesagt: Okay, dann du machst diesen nächsten Kunstgespräch mit, mit Lucy. Die Gespräche ist auf Englisch. Ja. Ähm, und das Introduction ist auch auf Englisch ab jetzt. Ähm, Ursula Meyer, a short biography, graduated from the uh, Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna and did her master's at Goldsmiths in London. Exhibiting internationally in 2014, received the Derek Jarman Prize for Experimental Film and the Altomar Prize in 2007. Living mostly in London, often here in Austria, sometimes with us, sometimes in Vienna. Um, and Lucy Scare, born in Cambridge, now living in Glasgow, uh, studied the Glasgow School of Art, and um, was nominated for the Turner Prize in 2009, the first time that I saw Lucy's work, in fact. And this exhibition that she's presenting here with us uh, is a collaboration with Kunstwerke in Berlin, so we were able to actually co commission Lucy with some new work uh, that they will discuss tonight, the two of us will discuss. Um, but other recent exhibitions include uh, Beyond the Grupo Kunstwerk in Berlin, the Museo de Mao in Mexico City, the MRSC Serignan, and We Do It in Rotterdam. And there are many, many others, but I'll keep it as a sort of executive summary so we won't delay the talk. Uh, a warm welcome to all of you tonight, and without any further ado, to see Ursula. We'll do the talk will be about 40 minutes, and then there'll be some uh, about 10 minutes for questions, and we'll wrap it up. Uh, one note: um, when we do finish the talk, we will need to move all the chairs out of that door. So, if when we're finished, if you wouldn't mind going to the other side of the of the gallery, would be great. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Great. Cool. Um, thank you, Seamus, for the introduction. And thanks, thank you particularly for, for, sort of, for being here. Um, I think it's actually a really nice chance that we can get to have a conversation about work. And um, yeah, I think it's, it's a nice to have artists talk between themselves in public. So hopefully we can um, also bring you along with, with that. <laughs> yeah, I'm also really happy to be here. Um, I think I saw Lucy's work the first time in 2007 in London, choosing a gallery. I think I also met you then. We were living there for two years, and then you moved to New York. Lucy's always like moving around, and then you lived after New York, you lived where you moved to. Um, I moved to Glasgow, but then I was never home. Okay, <laughs> it was like you have this typical artist life, like going around for shows, yeah. Yeah, the first time I saw the work, I was immediately drawn to it, and I'm, I really, really love it, so I'm, I'm happy to talk with you about it. So, I would like to start, maybe, to talk in terms of your process, making works, um, the way you kind of start from a two-dimensional image, or research, and then translate it. I mean, the translation of the material is at the base of your practice, so maybe you could talk a bit about that. Yeah, um, I think um, very often I, I am interested in abstraction, but I find it very hard to actually start in an abstract space. So um, quite often I try to find a way of moving from information or text or pre-existing image or pre-existing artwork and move towards um, something that's either more strange or more... Um, abstract or more more of an image. So quite often I take from an object to an image or from an image back into an object, like dragging it back into three dimensions from something that was maybe a drawing or an etching or um, an, an artwork. It goes both ways. Yeah, it goes both ways. Yeah. And in this particular body of work, um, you were telling me you had a book which you found in a charity shop and the book is about hunting and it's a, it's a book which is in a couple of 
museums or like it's it's a, a medieval book which is in a collection and you were really drawn to these prints and the relationship between animals and humans. Maybe you can talk a bit about what you really liked about the book and also how you translated it into this uh, installation. Yeah, sure. Um, so I found the book in a, in a charity shop. I quite often I buy a lot of books <laughs> and a lot of them I don't make into artworks, but they're somehow um, stuck in my, in my mind because um, there was something that's very satisfying about the pages of, of illustrations. So the book was made, um, I think, in 13, between 1340 and 1390, um, and it's a manuscript actually. So it's it's made by hand. It's not printed, um, and there's something that's very uh, satisfying about the depictions of the animals. So you, the pages, um, they have big illustrations and then they have some text about how to catch the specific animal um, and uh, the illustrations show the animals in all kinds of positions in the landscape and you realize that the different positions are also different times in their, in their lives so um, sometimes you have the animals having their babies and then sometimes you have them kind of older or about their daily life. So the, the images compress time in a particular way, and they're also very composed, they're very harmonious, so you can look at them and feel like this is the world and, um, and I fit within it in some way. Um, so I wanted to um, take this um, idea of a complete world, I think, um, and, and transpose it onto my sculptures. And part of the reason that I wanted to do that was because um, I think that the animals, you look at the animals from the hunter's point of view, you look at them with desire in your mind, you look at them as things that you want, you want to, you want to hunt them and you want to have them and you want to eat them. It's very visceral, it's very um, satisfying. And I have a relationship to materials in my work which is um, not dissimilar, like I want to make this object from this material and it's a process of, of desire for me. Um, and that's been true of many installations that I've made. So in a way I wanted to use the, the, um, these illustrations of the hunt to account for my own feelings towards my materials. The way you explained it now, I have to think about something in terms of resources of material and the way to treat resources and also the way, because you were talking also about empathy, you know, empathy towards animals, or like we were before also talking in terms of hunting and how indigenous cultures would kind of treat the relationship to how much or how they would hunt, and it's almost like a game of desire. It's like almost a ritual act the hunt in itself and then also because of your big desire to material so the kind of way you treat material is almost like the same kind of empathy you you, you create I think it's a very interesting thing you do yeah maybe I should say like what I actually did um, was take take previous sculptures that had been abstract and then I made them into animals um, so this is not answering the question that you just asked me, but the one before. Um, so I, I very simply like um, put ears on sculptures, so you can see there's like a, a leg on this wooden one, and and a pair of, of ears, and then arrows put into it. And when um, when I began doing that in the studio, it's a very funny process because you undermine your previous position of abstraction and then you impose this um, this other position of um, turning the material into something that stands in for something else like as a, as a depiction or a, as a representation um, and um, it's a very satisfying process but it's also as soon as you put an arrow into something that you're now thinking of as a as a hare or a rabbit, um, you feel 
the, the pain of the animal. So you start to empathize with the, with the material in a completely different way than if it's an abstract sculpture which has an abstract hole in it. Um, yeah. There's two things I want to think about because you talk about empathy and abstraction. So maybe first I, 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 I come back to empathy in terms of also there's another work in this group of, in the body of work which is in the back and is like a print work of, um, so you, you basically the work, the way you make it, you ask the Guardian newspaper to get like these plates for a certain period of time, and then you reprint that. And in this case, the image is um, actually that incident when in London uh, the tower block burned down recently. Yeah. And a kind of idea of empathy in this work. I'm just wondering, did that actually happen by accident? Because you don't know exactly what image you get, or how did it relate? To, yeah. How did this work come into being exactly? Yeah, um, I, I didn't know what was going to happen in the news when I asked for the plates, so in that way it came um, by chance. By chance. Um, but also I, I had the plates for two weeks and I just chose to work with this one, this one image. So, um, because it was such a, a shocking thing in, in Britain, um, this Grenfell Tower, because it was really like the um, the result of the politics of austerity and government cuts, particularly to, to housing. So it was like a social housing, um, and the, it had been clad with very cheap materials that had then um, burned on the outside of the building, and the fire had spread very quickly, and a lot of people died in the fire. Like the estimate is, is 90, I think, but. Um, no one knew how many people were living there because it was often people who weren't documented. <clears throat> so it's a very shocking moment, but also a very material moment. Like it was to do with um, the particular qualities of different materials and how they burned. That's a, it's a funny coincidence how abstraction and empathy comes together in that work as well, isn't it? Somehow, because the way you use the image is also a certain way of abstraction. You, you use something which is in, in the newspaper, but you also actually get rid of that information. We don't know this information. Yeah. Yeah. So it's an interesting way how things come back. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think that, that, um, that in taking away a lot of the text, for example, and printing them in these different colors that the, I mean, I'm using the CYMK plates, but I'm um, printing them in, in different colors, so I think that then um, a different reading becomes available, which is more to do with like the feeling of the flames, or like the, the way that the wind might move up the tower, or those are the kind of things that I'm thinking about when I'm making it, instead of the number crunching and whose fault it is, and where yeah. people are going to live, you know, so I think that when you when you repress one kind of information, you allow another type to rise up. I think actually when you say that, it's also something which I find interesting in, work, in your work, because you talk about empathy, but you also, there's no judgment in your work. You actually try to stay away from judging anything, isn't it? Because you try almost to empty out material sometimes, or empty out images, or kind of translate them back into their original meaning. And you talk about empathy and use like political moments, but then it's free of judgment, and I think that makes it also very interesting. You know? yeah. Because the, the way you at the same time position yourself, then yeah, I haven't yeah. thought of that actually. But it's it's true. Like like in this scenario, I'm not on the side of the of the hunter or or the hunted. Like I'm I'm just showing the the scene. Or you're showing also both the kind of moment of desire and the moment of pain, pain, which we all know and we know both sides somehow. It's, it's easier to not. Pos it's, I guess it's maybe interesting to not position yourself in that that moment. Or anyway, there's something else that uh, back to to another point. If when we're already talking about you know because there's a lot of death involved in this work, but you are also interested in in death and the cadaver. 
And why? I think it's, and I, I mean, I, I guess I read about it, or it's also because that moment of transformation, or transi transitioning from one state of being to another. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's um, going back quite a long way. I, I made a lot of drawings using um, photographs of, of cadavers, but I was really interested in this idea of a naturally occurring image, which the, the body when life has left it is. So there's this kind of transformation, which isn't a material transformation. I mean, it is a material transformation because you're not warm anymore or whatever, but, um, but in terms of like your weight is the same or it, it's there's been a, a removal of something and it's left. <laughs> it's left something that's almost the same, but it's but it's a, like a perfect image or a perfect sculpture, like it's fundamentally different. And I'm interested in in that process of like loss or gain, but mostly loss actually. And um, so the, you also showed this huge skull at some point. Which was, I guess, uh, this was for your Turner Prize exhibition. Um, or what was it? This kind of huge. Yeah. It was a, a skeleton of a whale. A skeleton, which also has a kind of relationship to death because it's animal is dead. Yeah. And sure. how did you, how do you have that relationship to, to showing actually something which exists? You know, you didn't really change that object. So how, how yeah. does that fit in in your work? Yeah, I didn't change the object, but I changed the way that you saw it. So the, the installation was, um, it was a, a whale skeleton that I borrowed from the Natural History Museum. And um, I built walls around it so that in the gallery you could only see it through little slits, like in the wall, this size. And there were maybe um, five slits in total. So you'd have this giant object um, in the room, like it was from like this wall to this wall, but you would only see it in these tiny details. So it didn't feel like something massive. It felt like something very, almost blank or, or very light. Um, so I suppose that's the way that I removed it. From its original. From its original. But I was, I was interested in it because um, because on one side, those, those collections of natural history are uh, to do with classification, and they're to do with order and, um, and uh, um, rationality. And in, in another way, like, there's a possibility that that whale could like, swim past you underwater. And it's such a kind of surreal or strange thought that you could have an encounter with that whale. That I think it was like the kind of tension of the two things. Which also like encompass the idea of, of the strangeness of, of death um, that I was playing with. And in this show, coming back to that exhibition, it was another piece. I mean, we have to also have to talk about this work, but I just have to think about a very iconic piece you did, which was um, kind of reworking some um, Vancouver object. And I guess this is also an important work to talk about the way you use materials. Or the kind of because you use basically the twelve birds in space, is it? the Vancouver sculptures, are yeah, like this bird in space, yeah. bird in space, and they're worms, and then you remade them and you cast them out of coal dust, and, but you made a group of it and a kind of and you called it kind of an alphabet, and I, I'm especially interested in that work in terms of again back to this transitioning of material and then maybe we can touch a bit here as well how you worked on, on the kind of idea of in-betweenness of this idea how materials travel. Yeah, um, so I made, uh, I made these copies of Brancusi's Bird in Space um, and I think I was, uh, it was in an installation that was called The Siege um, and this, the siege was like a kind of art space that was um, under siege. So um, I built a, a wall across the space and there was an inside and an outside. And on the inside, the things that were really um, paramount were, were the idea of time and resources, and particularly like time 
in relation to dwindling resources, to like running out of fuel or running out of food. Um, and I wanted to, to make a kind of parallel between the abstraction in Brancusi's bird in space, because how can something be both bird and space? Um, it's, it's like a kind of impossible thing to represent, but then he's represented it, which is brilliant. So I just wanted to kind of directly use that um, form, like rather than appropriate it. I don't, I don't think it's an appropriation, but that's maybe something we can talk about later. But um, yeah, I wanted to make it have um, a parallel with capitalism, with the way that material becomes abstract when it's traded, and also um, language, like the way that, that um, an alphabet or a, a font or I've come back to that again, <coughs> like the, the structure of, of language in some way. So um, changing the material for me was like uh, making it into a finite resource and then titling it um, Black Alphabet, which is, which is the title, was a way of making it relate that kind of usability to language. And the way you assembled that work, because a lot of times, in terms of also the group of work you have here, I've seen other installations where you maybe use, you know, it's almost like an, I guess you, you create your own language doing, developing all these different cultures. And it's different alphabets, if you talk about alphabets. And then you re reassemble all these objects in the installation again, and you even, Sometimes, for example, you told me today you're going to not keep this terracotta sculptures, which I think is crazy, but um, because you don't feel like you have use for it, and or you won't have that installation exactly the same again, or maybe you keep it and then you will reuse it in a in a different way. So I find it kind of interesting the way you resemble certain materials also like objects you have made during the period of being an artist so how how does how do you work with that uh, how, how does that work um yeah i think um it's it comes a bit from my usually the starting point for my work is responding to a, an architectural space so usually a gallery but sometimes a different space um, and when you do that and you make a work that fits the particular space that you've made it for, then as soon as you remove it, it's um, a different thing because it no longer has the architecture or the context that it has. And so for me, it's like a necessary thing is to repurpose the work because, I mean, not always, but if the work can't just directly move somewhere else, then. Um, then I need to change it, and that, that process of changing it has led to um, a more profound way of transforming the work as part of the practice. Doesn't it also question the way, uh, the, the way when you transform a, a material into an artwork in terms of its um, value after that? You know, I mean, you, you in, like as a market, you know, market value. So that's kind of interesting that you don't, I said that you, you're really open to kind of not play with that idea and not sit on that kind of object. I, I like it, you know, that you are. Yeah, I mean, sometimes it's, it's interesting for me to directly kind of underline the market value. Yeah. Like, I, I made this work, which was, first it was, it was a, an edition of three. It was some glass objects and they sat for the film. Um, and, uh, and then later I showed all six of the glass objects because there were two in each edition and there was an edition of three and I sold them as unsold editions. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I showed them as unsold editions. So then you're kind of admitting this kind of financial failure of the work mm -hmm. um, and it becomes embodied in a, in a completely different way. Um, it's kind of core of your, your kind of thinking. In well, somehow, in terms of the way you treat material, because you sometimes you bring it back to an original state, and you know you almost want to preempt them of meaning or of, of value. <coughs> I think it's something which which comes back a lot. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I am quite interested in the things that are legitimate to do in the art world and the things that are not legitimate. Mm. Like I'm interested in, like you usually don't show all of the editions of the work at the same time in the same place. 
like you're not meant to. But you do. <laughs> yeah, but you do. But or, or um, sit in the studio and turn your 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 works into animals by like nailing ear, ears on them. I mean, it's kind of ridiculous. On a minimal sculpture, on a minimalist sculpture, which they look like with, yeah, you know, yeah. and then you make them like into animals, which is yeah, it's there. Really. Well, it's, it's kind great. of silly. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it has a humor to it. Yeah. I mean, you have a, an affirmation, affirmation to, to kind of foolishness. That I, I was listening to an interview when you were talking about that you want to bring something into a work which is foolish. So, when did you do that and how do you do that? Uh, yeah, I... I um, the humor. Where is the, I mean, I see a lot of humor in it, but... Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's nice. Um, so when it came came in, this idea of, of becoming a fool mm -hmm. or playing the fool or something was I, I made a, a work with um, the Ship of Fools, um, which is another early book. You know, it's the Naren ship. Yeah, that, right. Um, and uh, I I carved the the um, illustration from the front of the book into the floor of a museum in Dusseldorf in K21. Um, and it, I made a huge woodcut from the whole floor of this image. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, um, I lifted the floorboards and I reassembled them, but I assembled them in the wrong pattern. Mm -hmm. And then I made another print from them. So, so basically the floor became the ship and the ship went more nonsensical as it traveled to different places because the, the order of the floorboards was scrambled and so the image wasn't as, as readable. Um, but I was very interested in positions of subjectivity because basically the ship is like all of these fools that all have their own reality and they can't decide where they're going to go and so they, they're heading to this utopia um, but they don't no. Well, well, they each have a different <laughs> idea of what that might be. Um, so then I thought, like, the, the, there's obviously a parallel between the artist's position and this position of extreme subjectivity. Um, and I just wanted to kind of explore that in, by making works from the viewpoint of the fool. So I was trying to make works about what the fool and the ship thought about the water. Like maybe a bit a bit frightened, but but enticed by its fluidity, and I made a parallel with that. So the work was called "Liquidity in the Mind of the Fool," and it was also sort of referencing um, systems of currency and moving of of uh, resources through money. Money is something which you also had a lot in your work. Also, there's some drawings, and they're like uh, old. Currency, which is not valid anymore, that is kind of state of certain, uh, yeah, values or, or currency. So how how do you translate that, or how did you use that in different work? Um, um, yeah. So the first the first one that I used was um, was in this this liquidity in the mind of the fool, and I bought a lot of pennies, um, which have been stamped wrongly. So they're coins that haven't been minted correctly, and then they get taken out of. Of the, of the system, mm -hmm. and they turn up on eBay as collector's items, which is really funny, and they're much more expensive than yeah. a penny, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but, but it's like the, the, the die has landed on like just a corner of the, or a little edge. So they're, they're really like part still copper and part money. Um, and then uh, I made my own series of banknotes with uh, some printmakers who they make prototypes for passports and secure printing and banknotes and things. And they're amazing, they're like a, they're a small family and they used to be fine art printers, but now they do this because it's more secure income for them. Um, but they were very open to collaboration. So I made like these banknotes using like Euro, Euro paper stock and using all these holograms and all of these features of secure printing. It was really cool. You could, you could call them access to have that. Or you just yeah, I just them. found the the guys and, ah, okay. and they were, and they were giving. Work. <laughs> they were okay. yeah. It's also something which you a lot of times your your research is, is kind of getting specific materials. Yeah, or like, getting into places. Also, like, like the one work you did with print stocks, 
which you got like this very specific stone from uh, where print stocks were made. I, I came a lot. I came a lot about you know because now of course I was looking much deeper into your practice. So I came a lot across works which you need a lot of time and acquiring access and and, and so resources. So it's interesting how you how you work with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not, I know how painful it is, but it's always fascinating. To, you know how what ideas are behind, and you know, how how far you have to go to sometimes you get to the result you want to have. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really, it's quite exciting when you can suddenly, I don't know, like, the, I think the moment that I think about most with that is that I, I worked together with a filmmaker, Rosalind Nashashibi, and we made a film in the Metropolitan Museum in New York, and we made it at, at night, and there was one moment, it took two years to negotiate the access to do this filming, and, um, and then one, like, just one moment I was, Putting the, like, I was just offloading all of the equipment into the basement of the Metropolitan Museum, and I was like, oh, we're, we're in. Like, we've. <laughs> Do you go back to this idea of foolishness somehow? I mean, yeah, like, of, 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 of being in, in the place of, uh, that's completely legitimated by all of these social structures, and then uh, and being able to do your own thing. Undermine uh, all that kind of. Yeah, to just do something different, maybe not even kind of counter or. But, um, so the relationship you have is collaboration because you just mentioned Rosalind Najahibi, which you work since a very long time, uh, but mostly with film. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you, how do you, how do you, like, how does it mean? What does it mean for you to collaborate, and how do you work with this idea? Yeah, it's it's um, interesting. Um, I I've, I've worked collaboratively all my time as an artist, like with various different people. Or, or I, I worked with a group called Henry VIII's Wives for 10 years, and then I started working with Rosalind um, more than 13 years ago now. Um, and I think that, that um, it's kind of an extension of, of the way that I work with other references. <coughs> that sounds a bit rude because obviously Rosalind is a person and not a reference, but um, <laughs> But uh, it, it's like you you allow each other permission to um, to almost like use the other person's brain and creative process as something that you add to your own, almost like as a kind of external hard drive or something <laughs> that you can plug in sometimes and unplug. Um, and it's to do with like permission that you give each other to think through each other's methods or practice. It's interesting, it's the first time that you actually mention hard drive. It's there's actually no... <laughs> every, for everything you do, you don't really use technology much, do you? I mean, of course, to kind of produce objects, but it's all like kind of quite traditional craft yeah. ways of making things. So it's, it's, it's a very specific position also in times where a lot of artists are using technology. Yeah, I mean, it's something that I, I don't have any proper explanation for uh, because because my work is it is anachronistic like it's not of this time I'm like I, I started working with 35 millimeter film as soon as like it became superseded by digital mm -hmm. uh, it, it's just hard for me to work with something that's completely current and I don't know I, I haven't figured out why that is um, <coughs> But I think it's it's something to do with with that I'm very interested in the way that things recede in time. Like with the the Guardian newspaper prints, I'm interested in the way that they mark a very specific date. Um, and usually, when I show them first, it's quite a recent date, so the 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 news is very fresh, and then they. After a year, the event is much more obscure. After like ten years, it's going to be probably forgotten. Um, so I'm interested in in the way that things age. So for that reason, like really new technology is quite hard for me to access. But I also think there's something else going on with that. I don't miss it. You know, it's not that I I miss it. I, I'm just thinking about it. You know. Yeah, it's true. I think also because your work is a little 
to do with this transformation of materials are almost like alchemistic sometimes, you know. Also the objects are quite charged. I mean, I was thinking about boys today, when we were talking about boys, the way, the very specific choice when you use materials and the way you charge them up by bringing them back, either through the, you know, the, pre, the meanings or, or the empty out different meanings from an image you come. I think that's such an interesting <coughs> circular process you're doing. And then you end up with an object which is still, yeah, it's kind of charged. I cannot say it in a different way because I think when you come in in this um, installation, it really fills that room with this empathy, empathy, empathy also for materials. You know, you feel the kind of how your desire for materials, your love to materials. It's really there in, in the object. Yeah, I think um, I, I was also, because we, we were talking about Joseph Boys and particularly like his use of fat and felt earlier, and it, mm -hmm. it's really interesting to, to me how those things, like he, he has his own narrative, which is to do with insulation and, um, or with copper in, in his work with conductivity, of like electri electrical conductivity. And it's a lot about and healing it also in his work, isn't it? Yeah, but he's decided that those materials have <coughs> said to do with himself and his mythology, mm. whether it's true or not. <coughs> but the materials are still the materials and they have their own properties. So, so um, I think it's really interesting how he um, doesn't try, he doesn't transform those materials. He just says in this context they need this. Which is, I think, very interesting. It's not quite what you're doing. Not quite what I'm doing, but it's not that far off because, like, for for instance, these uh, pieces of stone—they're not really an artwork. Like, they're not really transformed. They're more like kind of setting a, a scene. Mm -hmm. Like, they have a function in, in the room, but they're not—they're um, not as made as other things are. How do you, when I have to think now back to, to um, when you say that, in terms of when you're using other, because you're talking about other artists again, so how do you, when you work with appropriation, I mean, you don't really do appropriation. I would say no, if, you, if yeah. you use references, because also we talk about boys now, it's not that you also, or very specific, you use Brancusi and you used also other objects. Which ones? No. For example, um, uh, I've, I've used or uh, Nash is a really important reference yeah, to you. Or Nash. Nash. Yeah. British modernism is kind of this. A lot of sometimes you use very specific artworks, and then you um, Henry it, Moore or so. But you don't appropriate them. So how would you ex describe that process actually? Yeah, I think it's really different in different artworks. So um, Paul Nash. Like there's one painting that he made that's very inspiring to me just as a kind of conceptual artwork and it's called Equivalent of the Megaliths and it's a painting of like a British landscape and where the standing stones would be, um, he's just put these modernist forms. So he's using the context of, um, of uh, megaliths of, of like Neolithic <coughs> ritual stone rings and just inserting his own forms in that context. So that to me is just an inspiring <coughs> idea. Um, and, uh, and then Brancusi, I think that... In this case, you don't really, when you see the work, you don't really recognize the work anymore. In Brancusi, you actually I even think, recognize still the form. Yeah, I've never worked directly with the equivalent of the megaliths. Um, but yeah, in, in Brancusi, I think that there's a, I think that those forms do something, like they have an effect on a viewer, and what I want to do is just use them, <laughs> which is a bit cheeky, Fair enough. but I, I'm not trying to change the, the way that they're encountered, really. I mean, I'm changing it a bit, but I'm not undermining it or it's not to do with a shift in identity, of my identity. So I think it's quite different from appropriation. Yeah, no, I think so too. Yeah, so, I, so I'm interested in this idea of just directly using an artwork, which is also to do with collapsing time between myself and an 
other artists. But because sometimes could, it's also from a different generation or from a different period of... Yeah. yeah. But if I can use their formal language, which works in a particular way, to do what I want, then... Um, if you talk about collapsing time, you know, if you want to work with film, also you have sing singular practice and sometimes work with film. So the relationship of time and materiality in your films, how, how does that play out? Because I've seen one film where you... I don't know exactly now what location it was, but you had this cut out, like square cut out. Maybe you'd yeah. like to talk a bit about this work. Yeah, um, it, that was a, a film that was, um, it was a project called uh, Film for an Abandoned Projector. And the project was to find a 35 millimeter projector that was not in use and to make a film specifically for the viewpoint of that projector. So I imagined, I mean, a bit like thinking about being the fool looking at the water, I imagined the projector and all of these years that it sat mothballed and then um, thinking about what it would want to see or what its memory would be. Um, and so I made a, a film just specifically for these projectors that I found in an old cinema in Leeds and then we renovated the projectors and I made the film and showed it in the cinema which had been turned into a light bulb factory. Um, so we kind of renovated the cinema just enough to show images and then the rest of it just stayed as it was. But the film was site specific and then after that project had, had finished I destroyed the film by punching out all of the picture frames and then I made sculptures from the pictures and I also made the film so the... Sorry. What do you mean the sculptures of the pictures might be dead standing? The difference was I punched out all of the frames of the film. Yeah. I left just the very edge of the film. Yeah. So just the very edge of the film still plays. So and then, but then there's all of these like piles of pictures. And you made a work out of that. Yeah. What kind of work was it? Um, <laughs> it's actually it was at KW and it's not here, but it's um, it's like a I cast them in um, gum rosin, which is like a pre amber. It's like a tree sap but it hasn't fossilized yet, so it would, if it fossilized, it would become amber. Mm -hmm. It looks quite like amber. It's like the stuff that you put on your violin bow, if you know what that material is. Uh, yeah, no, yeah, it's okay. like a kind of um, orangey, amber-looking thing. And I cast it in a space in the gallery. Like, so in KW, I cast it in the windows with all the film frames stirred through it. Um, I showed it first in Portland at Yale Union, and they had this strange gap in the gallery wall, so I just filled it with this resin. And in, in some ways, it's, it's a bit of a parallel to this work over here, which is um, these kind of etchings of previous material that I've used. It's like, a, it's like, <laughs> it's like my subconscious or something. It's like something that doesn't, it, it's not yet articulated, or um, it doesn't have any kind of narrative or pattern. It's like just the material. I assume you go to this idea about film. I mean, if you use film instead of digital, that is also a chemical process to develop a film. You know, it also has to do with transformation of a material into something else. So it feeds in again in the way you work with film materials and circulate them somehow from one point to the other. Yeah, I'm very, I'm very, um, I'm always very reluctant to have to have um, a true illusion in the work. <laughs> I always try to undermine that. The true illusion. I think that's a good way to open up uh, for questions from the audience, if there are some. source it reminded me of uh, this situation, of course, more in the aftermath uh, in 2001 around the representation of the burning towers there in New York, um, that this was almost like a no-go zone in one way. I mean, there, were all, there was a lot of, it was, it was a taboo image in terms of it being 
um, circulated, represented by artists. Of course, the media is a different thing that's completely fine yeah. uh, according to sort of societal judgment and more moral uh, views and so on. But as a, a, a piece of representation, something to be um, manipulated, appropriated, reproduced, used, considered, etc., by an artist, this is something uh, at that time was quite hot. It was there were a lot of artists doing it, and it was uh, it caused actually a lot of commotion at that time. I remember it very very clearly. It became a hot topic. Um, in this case, it, there's something much quieter going on. I mean, specifically with your work. But I was just curious if this was something you thought about because when you speak about um, questions of empathy and uh, you know, I think it's such uh, an unrepresentable moment in time. I mean, the materials you speak about, I, I don't see immediately this connection to the other work that you do. But on the other hand, it's a hot topic and it's touchy. And I just, I was curious about if that's something you thought about when you're, you had ten or twelve or fourteen. Uh, different place to choose from, and, and that was the one that you decided to do. So not to put you in the hot seat, but I was wondering if it was something you thought about, like if it was something that crossed your mind. Yeah, um, yeah I think it's an interesting comparison. Um, it, I mean, it certainly did cross my mind. I was like, um, <coughs> but if you have two weeks of news and then you have the Grenfell Tower fire, and then you have like the other mostly kind of fairly non-eventful things that happened, I realized that my motivation for making this work, because I've made a, a series of works using these Guardian plates, and my motivation had changed. So um, instead, of, instead of using the plates to mark time, I actually wanted to work with the fact that that had happened. Um, so it's a complete shift in terms of my own position. But, with um, September 11th and, and those images, like I, I felt very strongly that they were con like they were always conceived of as images, like just the timing of the, of the planes hitting, so that mm -hmm. they would, I mean, they were perfectly orchestrated as images, yeah. and then to reproduce them is like a completely different act, I think, because because you're somehow complicit in um, in the way that they were powerful to see, yeah, the tactic of making this incredibly powerful image of, of destruction. Whereas I think the Grenfell Tower um, images, although they're, they're visually like kind of quite strikingly similar, um, like there was something that was never meant to happen that would be much more comfortable if it was never referred to again in terms of the government's position. Or um, So I think to reproduce them is a very different thing, actually. Um, different, yeah. but, the, but the topic, you, you consider that you're thinking of it. Yeah, I mean, as soon as I'm working with newspapers, I'm thinking about, like, what, why am, what am I doing? And, and because it's, it's in the political realm. Yeah. yeah, so I do consider what I'm doing, and, and some of the things I found quite hard to work with. Thank you.